Welcome, 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 my friend, to another episode of the Chasing Poker Greatness podcast. Today is a philosophical day. I am joined by Duncan. I am Coach Brad, the founder of ChasingPokerGreatness.com. Duncan, how you doing, sir? Good, good, good. How's everything with you, Brad? How's life treating you so far? Everything is going quite well, I think. To, to my knowledge, um, in this moment, everything's going okay. Um, that's always subject to change based on any <laughs> random number of things that might occur, but I'm pretty happy in the present moment. Glad to be sitting here having these interesting and sometimes difficult conversations mm. with you as it relates to sort of the philosophy of poker. And one thing, uh, you know, the thing that we're going to talk about today, the thing is, is poker hard, right? That that's sort of the big overview topic and what makes poker so hard? Can it be simplified? Those types of questions. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll just let you segue and get the ball rolling here in today's episode uh, of Philosophical Friday. Absolutely. Well, well, thank you very much. And, uh, and I think it's a it's an interesting topic in general, you know, is it is it clear that potentially poker is hard? And if it is, what makes it hard? There is a Usually with games of imperfect information, uh, our judgment is clouded and it's difficult to decide one way or another. But let's let's start with, you know, because again, we have a lot of questions. Let's start with, is, would you say that poker is hard? Is poker hard? Is, is it a hard game? Well, let's, hard to learn, hard to win. I guess that's the first qualification, right? Very good. Uh, of, uh, of that question. Mm -hmm. uh, hard to learn, I, I think no. Else, you know, it would not be as popular or no limit texas hold'em would not be as popular as it is mm -hmm. uh if it were hard to learn so you know easy easy to learn easy to sort of grab a hold of the concepts um hard to become a winning player i think the answer to that is yes um mm -hmm. but i again again like what, what how are we quantifying hard here what, what does right. that word mean right and we're using a lot of heuristics here, right? I mean, so uh, a lot of our definitions is how we feel them at the moment. And then again, the, the, digger, the, excuse me, the, the deeper we dig, the more precise we need to be with those definitions. But, you know, without being incredibly concrete with, with definitions, uh, so if we're using the word hard as something that takes uh, a lot of time, for example, or there is a lot of there's a lot of disagreement on what to, constitutes of the right strategy. I would consider that uh, you know heuristically as a sign of, of of toughness of difficulty, and and I would agree with you that you know it's very easy to learn and tough to master, kind of similar to chess. But the uh, I think one very important difference from games of perfect information like chess or backgammon is that. The, the fact that certain information is unknown and also it sort of like propagates over uh, a, a number of different hands, a, a huge number of different hands, makes it so it clouds our judgment, right? It is very difficult. You, you take a beginner player, for example, right? They, they're going to play the game for the first time. And, you know, they're dealt a hand like, I don't know, like six, three of hearts. And uh, they run that hand into a big hand, like let's say kings. And the six, three of hearts wins. So a beginner player may think, you know what, six, three of hearts. I mean, it's not that different than, than a pair of kings, right? I mean, you know, I, I, I just beat you with it, you know. So it can cloud our judgment in a certain way, which doesn't happen so much with games like chess. Because in chess, when once they lose their queen, uh, or like, you know, like a big piece of importance, they can see it right there. Oh, I made a mistake. It's clear I made a mistake. So with, I think part of the reason why poker is hard in my, you know, heuristic definition, if you will, is that it's not very clear what constitutes of a good uh, versus a bad move. I think that would, would sit at the core of what makes this, this game incredibly difficult. Yeah, it, the feedback mechanism uh, is just naturally distorted. You know, it, it makes me think of when I was playing checkers against my friend, because, you know, the, the old quote about like something is X is to checkers and then X is chess, right? Like mm -hmm. it's as it relates to like the complexity and the difficulty. And yeah, I can say, I, you know, I played my friend in an airport in checkers, probably 30 games in a row. Um, he just absolutely obliterated me. I had more pieces than him for one move 
in, in 30 games. And it was quite apparent that there is skill in checkers that right. I, I was lacking and that he had, you know, so like that feedback is pretty much on point, right? There's a lot to learn. Right. Um, in poker, that feedback, like we just said, you know, can be distorted. Um, I think also there's this ethereal nature of poker, this sort of emotional side of it too, that's again, difficult to quantify, but is nonetheless a piece of the puzzle because we can, you know, when things are going well, you can be a crusher. And then when things are going poorly, you can give away everything that you've earned. And, and, you know, that's less tactical and more emotional. So there's this also this just concept of pressure and emotion that, that also feeds into the difficulty level of poker that I think, um, other endeavors don't always have now fundamentally for strategy. I, I think, I think it's interesting too. like, yeah, just the way that people learn the way that they're taught, uh, how they create those neural connections in their brain from the beginning also play a part as to how difficult it is to learn how to play poker. Well, um, I think people can sort of latch on to bad information and then that's good. That just. Uh, exponentially exponentially amplifies the difficulty of playing poker well over time when you come into contact with bad information or when you internalize a bad decision uh, as a good decision, as in your example, the Tray Six of Hearts. Right, exactly. And and you're one of the people who talks a lot about uh, the emotions and the role they play uh, in poker. And I and I agree with you. It's uh, they're very fundamental and very, very important. And uh, what do you think, what percentage of, and again, I mean, this is uh, heuristically, we're not trying to be very scientific about it just to, to, to get a feel for it. Um, but what part do you think emotions uh, play? Like if we were to do like some sort of like a flow chart, um, we were talking about uh, traits uh, last week. And what do you think like emotional control, you know, what, what, what percentage of that chart, of that pie chart? Uh, would emotions take? Yeah, so I don't know. I think uh, it, it depends on the person mm -hmm. uh, to me. Like, so I, I'm not exactly sure that there's like a hard answer here as it right. relates to the pie chart, because with some people, it can be a large percentage and other people, it can be a smaller percentage. Something kind of just occurred to me too, that like, whenever we have a strong emotional connection to something, um, it tends to be stickier in our brains than if mm -hmm. we don't have a strong emotional connection. And so that can also sort of lead to bad decision-making um, mm -hmm. as it relates to, to playing poker. I think a good example is like, you know, your aces get cracked mm -hmm. and then you just make this heuristic, like a hand happened in a tournament recently where like guy opens button, guy three bets somewhat big. Uh, and then the button basically just, four bet rips and it was like early on in the tournament and they were familiar with each other and like the the small blind like tanked um and eventually folded and, and you know the button flashed aces right and it's like sometimes really he had aces <laughs> yeah he uh, yeah of course of course right like it, it was very obvious right that, that he's got aces but it, it's like sometimes strategy sometimes your strategy should be to slow play aces sometimes right. it should be too flat because it's going to make more money over the long run, especially in a situation like that, where it's very obvious what you have, right? And you just don't get a chance to maximize value. But if you have this strong emotional connection with your aces getting cracked, and it's something that must be avoided at all costs, well, then you never see that strategic door because mm -hmm. you're too emotionally invested in preventing your aces from getting cracked instead of winning the most money when you're playing poker. Um, so I think that like emotions are, are really a very large piece of the pie. Um, and, and I do think there's variance in how people kind of deal and internalize uh, the feedback that they're getting from their emotions when they play poker. And I mean, mostly, I, I guess, going back to last week, the trait, I think the trait would be to analyze these sort of strong emotional connections that you're making while you're playing poker so that we can sort of make sense of them before they solidify uh, in our brain. And we just have these like automatic feelings in these specific situations. But yeah, I mean, emotions are clearly a, a large part of the puzzle. I think that's more related to like the learning process of poker than it is, um, you know, dealing with sort of like any sort of tilt in game. 
Absolutely. And you're making a very good point, you know, that emotions actually, uh, they're not only part of the strategy, but they permeate across different levels of poker, right? I mean, the example you just gave is a perfect one. And then I would add a couple more, if you don't mind, just, just to your point, because it's an excellent sure. point. Like, for instance, again, somebody feels the stress of a specific hand and they want the hand to be over. So they want to just put a raise right there. You know, they, they cannot take the stress anymore. It's like, you know what? I'm not going to just flat call there. I'm just going to just let it let it go. You know, I just want to move to the next hand. I'm just, you know, I can't feel the right. stress, which is a very emotional decision or even at a higher level, bankroll management, or at, and even at a higher level, how do somebody, you know, like approach the game of poker so that they don't have a mental fatigue over time? So all of these are emotions. Like, are you, are you sharp enough to sit at the poker table that day? That can be an emotional decision that from a business perspective. Yeah, so <laughs> poker is hard. That's poker the, is. <laughs> poker is hard. I agree with you. Like, you know, poker is incredibly, incredibly hard. Uh, and, yeah, that, that uh, feeling you described, by the way, people... Uh, the listener can probably relate to it if they imagine, you know, they're afraid of heights, right? Mm -hmm. And the thing that when people are terribly afraid of heights, when they are somewhere high, they imagine themselves jumping, mm -hmm. right? I, I don't know why this is such a thing, but they do to basically relieve the pressure and the get fear that they're feeling, get it over with, right? Right. right. Um, it's sort of this impulse. And I think that like that sort of impulse can also manifest, like you said, that's sort of what's happening when it's like, yeah, I don't know what to do here. Just get this hand over with. I'm all in, right? right. When all in is like clearly the worst option. And even in a rational state, they, they would probably tell you that all in is the worst option. But in the moment, they just want out. I, I agree. And, and and this is why, you know, it, it does make sense to actually talk about any sort of emotional control. Usually people when say emotional control, the first thought that comes to mind is, is tilt or tilt control, but it's way more than that, I would say. Like, you know, being able to control emotions in a game which is dominated by them, uh, it, is, it is a very important aspect. And another question we, we can ask as it relates to all of these things is, okay, so those who play the game for a long time, they realize how difficult it can be but what are some poker elements that potentially make it deceptively, deceptively simple, so to speak? Why is there a multitude of people, mostly recreational players or those who haven't been exposed to the game so much, that they may think that actually poker is an easy game or is it far more luck uh, than it actually is? Yeah, I think, I mean, that, that to me feels like, you know, Dunning-Kruger, just mm -hmm. when you have a low level. Uh, Tell level. the listeners and, a little and, bit about Dan and Kruger. Sorry to interrupt you, but just yeah, for those so who may not know what it is. But Basically, when you have a, a low level understanding of a topic, you tend to overestimate your ability, your skill level. Um, and then sort of interestingly, on the flip side of that, when you have a high level, uh, high level of knowledge in a specific topic, you actually underestimate your <laughs> skill level uh, relative to the rest of the humans who play that thing, right? Um, the classic Dunning Kruger example is, uh, you know, like cars and driving, and like mm -hmm. you know, ninety percent of drivers believe they're in the, like the top ten percent uh, of drivers, right? Which obviously right. can't can't be true. Right. Um, or yeah. like Tommy Angelo puts it, right? Seventy five percent of poker players think they're better than the other seventy five percent. Right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> um, and so that's sort of how the Dunning-Kruger effect works. I think what's interesting to me is, here, here's an interesting question. Do we make poker harder than it needs to be, right? I think that's ultimately one thing that makes poker exceptionally hard mm -hmm. is making the game more difficult than it really needs to be by just uh, listing and internalizing poor heuristics, not training properly, mm -hmm just a, a variety of, of, you know, sort of internalizing the need for like a complex solution in spots that there are simpler, simple solutions. And we don't need to like over complexify everything in poker. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that like, in, in that sense, while I think poker is hard, yeah, I think that this on the same token that we make poker harder than it should be. Mm -hmm. um, and so sort of going down the rabbit hole of like, how do we remove that? How do we stop making mm -hmm. poker 
um, more difficult than it should be. I think that that's an interesting discussion as well. Uh, absolutely. And uh, can I take a crack at it? Because I love that question. Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> and then we'll, we'll go back to why is it deceptively simple? Because you raised two very, very important questions. God, I love this podcast so much. It's so much fun. <laughs> Agreed. So yeah. uh, apologies for the listener for going all over the place, but that's, I think that's important because that's how usually discussions happen. Like, I mean, we discover little doors and, and then we, we want to go through them. We're curious. Right? So do we sometimes make the game harder than it has to be? I think, I think the short answer is yes. And here's why. I can actually give an example as it relates to poker strategy. Uh, where a, a lot of people are basically swinging the pendulum on both sides. So I've seen this over and over again. I interact with a lot of intelligent people who are new to poker, and this is usually the adjustment that I get from them, right? I'm going to simplify that, not oversimplify that a little bit so that you can get the idea. So imagine a new player c- comes and then we're having a discussion. And, and one of my first points is going to be that, you know, one of the ways you can be a winning poker player, it's a necessary but not a sufficient, sufficient condition, is aggression. So one of the first things that they realize, they realize that they are under aggressive, right? They're not aggressive enough in their game. So the very first thing they, they do, they overcompensate, right? So they start from being under aggressive or passive. And now what happens to them? They're just like, you know, they bet every flop, right? I mean, they three bet every hand. They become over aggressive, right? And then they realize that over aggressiveness is not going to work. So they kick it down a notch. And now before you know it, they realize that, they underbet flops or they underbet rivers. Like they go below what you consider, you know, a good level of aggression. And then they realize that and they just overcorrect again. But every overcorrection tends to be a little bit less than the overcorrection from before, if that makes sense, right? So if there's like bullseye is right here in the middle for those of you watching on YouTube, they're gonna go far to the left, then a little bit less to the right, then a little bit less to the left, a little bit less to the right. And eventually, hopefully at some point they, they calibrate themselves. I think the same is true, very much is true by the way we, how hard we actually want to make a poker. You know, again, we quoted Einstein before as, as saying that, you know, you want to make things as simple as possible, but not simpler than that. The same is true with poker. We want to be right about the complexity of the game. But what can happen at the beginning, we err on the side of being overly simplistic. Then we err on the side of of over complexifying it. Then, you know, overcorrect again by making it a little bit simpler than it has to be. And hopefully at some point we find our bullseye. So I think like part of the difficulty is to actually be honest about the game itself. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Yeah. I mean, and I think it's such, the game is so nuanced. There's so many different variables and so many different components that most people just feel overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Um, It's like when they load up their poker training site and they start watching a video or start looking into the the information, um, it's like drinking water from a fire hydrant. You know, Mm -hmm. it, it just doesn't they don't know what to do with it Mm -hmm. right and this this is the main reason why people would reach out to me for private coaching right Mm -hmm. i have a questionnaire and i ask them exactly like what they're struggling with and oftentimes the thing is i don't know what to study i have no idea what to study right which is an interesting statement considering there are endless things to study poker right there are just endless places to study poker and learn right to me, what, what they're actually saying is they don't know how to progressively improve at poker. They right. don't know the exact steps to take, step A, sequentially, to move the needle and improve their ability to play poker, right? They, they just don't know. And to my knowledge, you know, I think that a lot of the training sites in existence haven't done a great job of sequentially making this feasible right right and, and it, um, in their defense is very difficult right i mean that, it is quite it, difficult it, it is, it, quite it, difficult, it is right. the mother of all problems right, right. It, it is a giant giant problem and yeah this is something that has kept me awake at night absolutely just wondering how how do we do this right and, and this is sort of like the the genesis of well my my entire path of you know starting with like pre-flop boot camp specifically right this was like my first course the first step that I believe you should take to upgrade your poker game. There's actually steps before preflop, by the way, which, you know, there, that's neither here nor there, but <laughs> that, that to me is like the first real step to take. And then from there, it's like, what's the next step? And then what's the next step? And then how do we do this? And then, then there was, you know, fish in a barrel and feeding frenzy that were C betting against 
uh, fish, which is specifically, you know, one component of poker, right? It's like mm -hmm. one thing that happens with a high frequency that is a high value situation that knowing it will improve your ability to play poker. However, there's a bunch of spots that are still question marks. They're blank on the map, right? So to me, it was like, it was always obvious that poker is not just one game, that poker is a multitude of games, you know, probably hundreds and hundreds of different mini games kind of masquerading as this one game. And the only real way to progress in poker is to kind of master all of these mini games, which is what ultimately led me to saying, you know what, if I make a program like the CPG Wolves um, that has this specific path, right, of mastering all of these different mini games, putting them together holistically, and then upgrading uh, the player on the other side, like a poker factory, basically. Um, that was sort of the the progression of like a teacher and educator in this space of solving this program of like, what makes poker so hard? How do I make it easier? And how do I create this path? And then, you know, the, the next step in that process is just uh, learning how to teach the information, how, how to educate players, how, how do I um, transfer this information to their brains over a few months uh, period of time, right? That So again, which is not a simple problem, that is a giant problem. So it's one giant problem to another giant problem. But I mean, a as a poker trainer and somebody that creates training material, yeah, th this sort of idea of, you know, what is poker? Why is it so difficult to learn? How do we train the right things? You know, it's something that's consumed me, you know, for well over two years now. Um, and these are just kind of the conclusions that I've come to and sort of how I like structuring my stuff and it makes it makes sense to me. It makes sense to me too. And, and you're making a great point here because you really are revealing the biggest issue. What is the biggest issue of people overcorrecting? Essentially what, what's happening there, because this is something I've thought about it a lot. What happens with people overcorrecting, they're always looking for the easiest way to deploy a certain strategy, right? The person who thinks that poker, for example, is too, too luck based, is like, it doesn't matter what I do. That's easy, no, not, not much energy required. The person who overcorrects and becomes overly aggressive, they say, you know what, it's easy. All I have to do is bet all the time, bet, 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 bet. But what you did, what you did with your example before, right? Notice what you said. You said there's these spots we come up frequently. So basically what you're trying to do, you're trying to help them with this need for falling back into a simple strategy without, however, robbing them from the entire complexity of the game. So you're saying, here's a spot where that simplification can work for you, right? Because this spot comes up again and again. So you can fall into some simple patterns which don't necessarily require much energy, but at the same time, we're talking about the low hanging fruit. So right. you're really nailing it here. And I hope this can be useful to the listener because Brad's point here is, is so spot on. I can't even find the right words to express how spot on it is from an educational standpoint. I think this is really the real issue. And, and actually, here's an irony. Uh, GTO, in that sense that we're describing right now, GTO can be the lazy approach in some sense that I'm talking about, because it, it's easy. If, if you tell somebody, you know what, all you have to do is follow GTO, that's easy. So all they have to do, put it on a solver, get the answer and just follow the answer every time. From an energy standpoint, following GTO is actually easy. So if it's that easy, it's probably not the solution. If the answer is you cannot, you don't need to spend any energy, it's not probably the right approach because most of the winning strategies, most of that calibrations to not overcorrect on the, on the one side or the other, does that cal calibration does require energy. So if, if the final answer is you don't need any energy, you know, poker is all luck, just do whatever, or you don't need any energy, poker is all GTO, just follow GTO, probably neither of these approaches are the correct ones. Right. Because they, there is necessity. And I love what you're saying, because by saying having all of these mini games, essentially what you're trying to find is you're trying to find some common thread so that you can reduce the amount of energy to as little as possible without going further than that. Like the, the Einstein principle, make it as right. simple as possible, right? Find the common thread between all those mini games, but don't make it any simpler than that. And I love that because again, this is not to take anything away from your amazing approach and answer, but this is what I tried to do also when I wrote the book. Like I tried to find a way where we can find the core of these basic principles that can keep the energy consumption to as minimum levels as possible without oversimplifying. Right. And, and I mean, 
it's a hell of a question and much more difficult <laughs> than I think folks kind of give it credit for. And going going back to what I said about preflop, right? I think like they're just the internal mechanisms of poker, equity, how equity works, how equity shifts, all of these things. I, I think theoretically, you know, when people are entering the game, they need to have an idea of like what's happening. I think this is like the first step is like, so like fundamentally what's happening here and do you see how this is happening, right? Mm -hmm. Because like when you, when you, when you kind of understand the pieces of the mechanism and how it's working together, then you have a better idea of like the game itself and what the game actually is. And then from that standpoint, it gives you like a good foundation for taking future steps. But yeah, I mean, the reality is, is like, it's a big game tree, right? That's mm -hmm. the, poker has a giant game tree. It's massive and is dependent upon the opponent you're playing against because we're playing uh, poker against human beings, right? Which is uh, kind of a very interesting variable in it. and a thing that makes poker, you know, very near and dear to my heart is that, you know, different human beings have different strategic deficiencies and need to be approached in different ways when you're playing against them. And that's where like meta considerations come in. Um, so yeah, my approach is break it down as break it down into pieces so that you have at least some cursory idea of what to do in each individual situation. And, and as you said, in, in the beginning, folks will just say, oh, you know, like s somebody watching a play and explain video, this, this has happened, uh, with past students where mm -hmm. it's like, you know, I, I three bet like eights or something from like versus MP or I, I flat, I check call with like a bluff, bluff catcher. And they're like, oh, you're supposed to just check call here with eights. And it's like, they write it down, right? And it's like, well, wait, like that's not, <laughs> you know, there's like a hundred different variables here that we should be considering. And like that lead to this decision is, it's not like I make this decision every time. It, it's that this specific situation merits like check calling instead of betting or, you know, whatever the, the situation may be. Um, so when you understand the mechanisms in place, you understand the decisions better. And if you understand the decisions better, that allows you to upgrade your, your thought process, which basically the, the way that you think about poker, our thoughts are what dictate our actions. And ultimately that that's the end goal. I, I agree. And I think that's the key word here, thought process. So when the person plays the hand and whatever they check call the river with pocket eights it has nothing to do with check calling and has nothing to do with eights. It has to do with the thought process. Right. And the important part is that here is the issue with the thought process. Thought process requires energy and people want to save energy. So it's much easier to say, oh, that's how I play eights, you know, set it and forget it. You know, just I make the note. Now, you know, I have my mnemonic. Next time I have eights in a similar spot, I check all and I never have to worry about it. However, that idea of the thought process is what matters. So what I would say, however, because again, then the important question arises and it's like, okay, but Duncan, wait a minute. Are you telling me we have to think of a million different situations? How do we deal with those? And that's basically Brad's point at, at this point, right? Because he said, break, break it down and break down the thought process. And if you break down the thought process, similar spots will be grouped together now. So for instance, the thought process could be, if I get check raised on the river, let me just take an extreme example. Usually the opponent has the nuts. Why do they have the nuts? Because there's a certain thought process that most people tend to be tricky. And when they're slow playing, they usually are going to set the trap on, on, on the river and all of that thought process, which is rather a common thread. So right. well, that also, another thing, I just want to dig please. into that, that for a moment too. Another thing is that like, when they have their weaker hands in a lot of situations, they have taken a different action on any street. And so through the filter of the flop and the turn, um, when they arrive at the river, firstly, they probably don't have enough combos in their range or they have too many combos. Right. And then when they raise, most of the time, they just have too few combos that they're raising with, or they have too many combos that they raise with, which you know, is what is like a volatile opponent who, right. you know, th in that case, you know, you get to snap call. When snap call, raise. exactly. But here's the thing, whether you snap call or you snap fold, 
just based now. on their the, yeah right and, and it's based on, the, on that story right i mean the thought process so it's about the thought process right but the thing is that it's not about making notes for each individual hand but keeping track of the commonalities between these thought threads essentially and that is something that you know we keep the energy to a minimum but we still have to spend the energy to understand those thought processes and this is right. something and like, they change right that's they the thing. do change exactly exactly that's like the the emotional element of it too o outside of anything tactical players thought process will change based on the emotion that they feel but, and... but he, here's the, the important part if you are depending on the thought process as the player suggests your thought process is going to be adjust as well exactly right. it's going to adjust accordingly exactly right. that's the whole so, point that's the thing to measure. That's the thing to upgrade is the way that you are bucketing information, the way you're thinking about hands, the data points you're analyzing that that's ultimately the priority. And it shouldn't be like the result of the hand. It shouldn't Correct. be even the decision that you make. It's how you arrived at that decision. Right. Not that's even the assumptions, the... I would say, sorry, again, I'm getting too excited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Not even the assumptions, like the, the assumptions are also irrelevant. I tell my students, assume whatever you want, just assume something, assume the craziest thing in the world. As long as you have a thought process, you can calibrate that. If you have no assumptions, there's nothing to calibrate. Right. There's, there's nothing to even look into or analyze, which is why, you know, in private coaching that the mechanism that I've used forever is, uh, make a plan, explain video and describe your thought process. Tell me how you're thinking about these spots. I don't really care about the decision you make. Right. What I want to know is how you, you came to that conclusion because, you know, the flip side is also true. Like you can do bad things and get a good result. You can actually do the thing you're supposed to do for a wrong reason, right? Right. Which means you took the correct action, but the process to arriving at that answer is flawed right. and that needs to be corrected. So like that, that's why like really figuring out what you're prioritizing, what you're thinking about in the moment is really key to upgrading your ability and learning how to play poker at a high level. Um, which yeah, again, I, I know it's difficult and that can be arduous and you definitely need someone who's experienced to give you feedback to help you upgrade because in the same way that like um feedback in poker can be distorted feedback from another human being who's a lower level player can also be distorted distorting too and cause just devastating detrimental effects to the way that you think about poker and that in that way you know it's like uh just sort of have some sort of like old man coffee type saying that you internalize and then you integrate right. that into your thought process right well, right oh tight is right so they're like this is now a priority in my thought process and the way i make uh decisions at the poker table which yeah that that can be ultimately exceptionally devastating and so finding the right people it always sort of comes around back to that in poker is, is kind of the key for poker learning because you need people to you need people to challenge Mm -hmm. um, and help you upgrade your metacognitive abilities. That, uh, that's really the key. Absolutely. And what you're actually also describing, it's, uh, it's very mentally taxing at the same time, you know, like incorporating all of these ideas sitting at the poker table. So finding somebody who can, you know, help you sort these things through a little bit can be incredibly helpful. And I, and I, and I agree with you. I agree with you 100%. But also one of the things that we discussed on our very, very, very first uh, podcast is the idea that if somebody tells you that it's it's easy, they're probably lying to you, right? So there's still not going to be a substitute for hard work. There's still not going to be a substitute for for some right. energy spent on on our part. Yeah, you you told me you know last week you asked me the question of like how many people will actually go through. You know how many people will like if they had me as a mentor and right. I'm pushing them. How many people are just going to give up? And you know. To me, probably 90 to 95 people are just going to disappear and give up, right? So it is difficult, right? It, I, I think it's doable, but it's challenging. It's hard. And if you think that it's going to be easy, and that's another thing too, I think folks will tell you that, yeah, I know it's not going to be easy and I'm willing to do anything. But like, it's like Mike Tyson says, you know, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Um, <laughs> right, 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 right. And then they get punched in the mouth and then they kind of like give up because it became difficult. Right. So, right. yeah, I mean, that sort of goes and ties into mental strength, which will probably be another philosophical Friday discussion down the line. But, uh, yeah. Um, Absolutely. And so this is a great segue for the next question. It, it is not going to be easy. Is there any way we can make it easier or simplify it 
uh, without oversimplifying it potentially. So how can we, as poker players, you know, as eternal students of the game, how can we make the game uh, not harder than it has to be? What are some things uh, we can do to make it more tractable over time? Yeah, isn't this the sixty thousand dollar question like for, <laughs> for all all human beings who are in the poker training space and you know like like myself running a, a CFP group? Right. Um, I, I think it's a work in progress. Like, I, I mean, so for me, again, you, you, we had this sort of calibration that you described, mm -hmm. right? Uh, of like one way, one way, and then eventually kind of landing like in a in a solid middle ground. And and to me, it's about trial and error, iterating, figuring out what's working, what's not working for different human beings, and then kind of going from there. But I mean, it's an ongoing process. And to me, it, you know, is kind of like the holy grail as it relates to upgrading human beings ability to play poker over a short period of time is trimming away the fat, focusing on what matters, and then conveying that information in a way that makes sense. And they can remember it, and then they can execute it in game. Um, and, and yeah, I have a lot of these thoughts, but I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know about talking about them sort of publicly right now, because a lot of the information, a lot of the things that, that I think about are just filled, funneled specifically to the CPG wolves. Sure. And, and that's sort of part of their edge, sure. but going, going to, uh, something that I remember Patrick Howard, somebody said about Patrick Howard was something along the lines of like. To me, it feels like Pat, you're you're trying to make poker strategy so simple that anybody can execute them, right? <laughs> and that was, yeah, I think that's exactly what Pat's trying to do. And I, I think that all the the human beings who have ambitions in this space, that's what they should be trying to do. That that is the ultimate goal and the ultimate thing to kind of figure out if that makes sense. So I, I kind of, I guess, dodged your question. No, 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 no. I, I think I think you're actually raising a very, very important point. One that I think it's kind of an irony, right? Because any good educator, they're going to try to create a, a method that can work for everybody. But there is, I would say, some natural limitations as they pertain to the things that we were discussing last week that automatically will make all of us fail, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's my holy grail too. I was writing the book. I wanted to like anybody who be willing to think for themselves, they would be able to, to be helped. The problem is of course, like we discussed that some people just, they sort of like fail before they start. And that's not for me, for any of us to decide, but that's, you know, kind of like the reality. In, in yeah. that sense, any universal strategy I feel is going to fail for that reason. But other than that, it's kind of an irony that all of us are trying for this, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, the answer to answer the question, can the game be easier or simplified over time? Yes, of course it can. And the, the reality is, is that to me, the solutions exist. Right. They're there. I just haven't found them yet, but I'm going to find them, right? That That's sort of the, the journey and what gets me out of bed in the morning right. is answering that question. Um, and, you know, the follow-up question is, uh, of course, the downside, right? And the, the dangers in potentially oversimplifying. For sure. Um, before, before we go there, uh, just very quickly, you mentioned uh, that uh, you cannot disclose some of this uh, publicly, which is perfectly understandable. I happen to have an example that I mentioned in the book that I, I very much have mentioned publicly before. Sure. And I sort of like to, to have an example. And that example is the idea of, once again, extracting some things that give the player uh, the edge, in this case, Alex, the heroine of the book. And I describe it as the poker trifecta. Preflop strategy, what are the three things that Alex is doing better than her counter character, Bobby? Bobby prioritizes fun over profitability. Alex, she prioritizes profitability over fun. And the poker trifecta are simply basically playing in position, uh, having card advantage and initiative. And the reason why I like something, obviously, you know, just to say that these three things are exactly what makes you like a good <laughs> preflop poker player would be a disservice to anybody who's listening right now. And that's why, you know, that chapter is, I don't even know like how many pages long, <laughs> right? But I still think that there is power in heuristics on being able to simplify those things, for, at least for our brains to quickly recollecting them those ideas, right? So you can ask yourself, do I have position in this hand? Am I the last raiser? Do I have a better range than my opponent? Like these are three questions that usually as a quick way to, uh, and of course we can have uh, at least one uh, podcast for each of those three topics, position, yeah. initiative, and card advantage, and I'm not gonna go there, but that would be an example of 
simplifying, but then at the same time, having spent thousands of hours understanding why position matters, right? So right. anytime we need to actually say, okay, is that is me having position right now the same as the previous hand high position? No, and if not, why not? Like getting into those nitty gritty when we need them, that's what makes the, the difference, right? But having right. a starting point, which is simple, can help. And I, and I think we're sort of targeting two different avatars here. Mm -hmm. uh, two different human types, right? Like I think you're targeting someone who's sort of entry level into poker, right? Just entering or has some sort of like inter intermediate not skill necessarily. set in poker? No, no? Not necessarily. You know what's the difference with the person who's entry level? The person who's entry level, he's going to use those heuristics, but he's not going to go very deep. I know people, myself included, uh, who, you know, they're thinking those things as uh, like an iceberg, right? I mean, this is the tip of the iceberg. And then below the iceberg, there's like this first, huge... first principles, right? First yeah. principles. Exactly. But then below it, there's like so much to be discovered, sure. right? So sure. much nuance. So I would say the difference is again, that entry players, entry level players, they're going to just stick to those three and they're not going to go underneath the ocean to see what's in there. But I do think that there is some value in um, starting simply and then going into the threads into the roots of the tree so to speak yeah okay yeah. i'll buy that yeah let's go to your to your question are there any dangers uh in in potentially oversimplifying things which is which ties really well to that i mean what would be a danger of people oversimplifying things and thinking that you know preflop is all about position initiative and card advantage what would be some dangers of that yeah i mean the danger is that they'll have a high level of confidence in their metacognition in a situation where they have no right to have a high level of confidence, right? Exactly. They're overconfident that they're making good decisions and then angry that the results aren't coming their way when the reality is they should not be confident in the decisions that they're making, right? So like instilling that, that sense of confidence in, in situations where like, you know, you could ask me, I mean, like the classic one, right? Is there's a lower level player who's like struggling and very confident about what they're doing, right? And they express this confidence that like, oh, I, I made this decision on the flop and this decision on the turn. I, I need to know this decision on the river, right? And when I look at it, I think, wow, I am not confident about your decision on the flop or the turn at all. <laughs> right. Like I, I have, and, and it's not that right. I'm being like, trying to be humble or what it's just i don't know i right. need to investigate this this merits investigation and merits thought and reflection um so yeah of course there, there's real danger in oversimplifying things that the example that i mentioned before of you know never slow play aces right right I, I think that's just a silly silly heuristic and that is an oversimplification and i think that yeah that that ought to be questioned um the more subtle danger i think can come in oversimplifying when you don't know that you're oversimplifying like mm -hmm. for on on the other end where it's like a, a strong player um who's trying to simplify a strategy but they actually oversimplify it and then they don't, they don't realize what they did and i think that happens routinely um especially when folks are like retooling their their poker game uh john went through a phase last year where he started um he went from like c betting every flop uh, for a third to checking back, um, mm -hmm. at a higher frequency without having a plan at all. Like he just did not know how to react to like turn bets after checking back the flop. Right. And it was like, right. oh, so, you know, you decided to take your simple strategy and then kind of shift it. And, and then you oversimplified to checking back more without having any kind of plan. And then you ran into these downstream mistakes, but you were confident that checking back the flop was better for some reason without really investigating what what's going on. He just thought that giving himself that action would make his life easier and increase his win rate right. without really understanding the downstream effects of doing said thing, right? So right. that's always the danger of, of oversimplifying. It just creates a distortion. And I think it's probably the major thing that handcuffs beginner poker players as they're trying to upgrade their ability and win more money and upgrade their ability to th their thought process, the way they think about hands, is just like too many oversimplifications. Right. We're not investigating why, and it's just very, very bad for, you know, the long-term prospects of your poker journey.
Uh, absolutely. And it's alluring, right? I mean, that energy of course cons- it. Of course uh, consumption, yeah. right? Because they, they're like, you know, it's so energy draining to have to make a decision every single second you play that game, right? I mean, it's... Well, it's, this is the game. This is I mean, the game. Come, come on, guys. This is the game, exactly. right? Like, you want to be a, a football player, but you don't want to <laughs> exert energy on the field? Like, right. you, do you just want to, like injure yourself so you're on the sideline riding the bike every game like you're in the fucking game and the game is hard absolutely so, absolutely i'm it. with you 100 percent. one thing that i would say however and, and maybe this is definitely a topic for another another time the idea of like noise reduction mm-hmm. the idea of basically making things simpler for ourselves and, and surviving these long lasting sessions you know like 10 hour grinds and stuff like that the first thing is, that's the game. I agree with you 100%. My students call me the worst marketer ever because like, the very first things that I tell them is like, you know, this is not going to be easy. If you think this is going to be easy, maybe it's better to part ways. It's not going to be, it's not going to be easy. And they, you know, sure. some, some of course appreciate that, but some, they don't like it because they want like, you know, an easy fix anyway. Well, um, my, the name of my first course is pre-flop bootcamp, right? Bootcamp, and right. bootcamp is not supposed to be easy. easy and right. people ask me like, oh, like this seems like a lot. This seems like hard work. Well, yeah, it's called bootcamp. It's not supposed to be easy, but it's necessary. Exactly. I agree with you 100%. One thing I think strategically we can do, and this is again, me developing, you know, heuristics, right? Because again, I would go and play those sessions for 10 hours at a time. And, you know, like at the end, I would be completely drained. And I was asking myself, okay, sometimes like I would go to those sessions uh, that was a few years back, I wouldn't talk to anybody because I would pay attention to every detail that was happening at the poker table. You know, I was like, Mm -hmm. I was like, how do people have time to check on their phones? Uh, And I actually... In retrospect, I thought that was a mistake because I was overexerting myself, right? And, and there is something to be said for preparation before the table, which I was also doing, but at the same time, pace yourself at the poker table because it's a marathon, not a, not a race. And oh, is that, you, dis- is that, you disagree with that? I do disagree. Okay, please, I, please I think go that ahead. When you, start, when you do something, over time, the more reps you put in, the easier it gets. And that mm-hmm. ener- energy exertion is a necessary part of the process to me. So like while, you know, paying attention to physical tells or some sort of meta consideration or whatever it is that like you're working on upgrading or learning more about or investing your focus and Mm -hmm. your energy on in the moment, like, yeah, in the beginning, it's quite difficult, but over time you sort of learn what's important, what to prioritize, what's not, what's less important, but only through investing a lot of mental energy are you able to differentiate between what's important and what's not important so to me that's just like a part of the process is like yeah when you do anything like it's going to be hard however over time it gets easier so to me yeah being mentally drained mentally taxed in in your sessions you're learning you're upgrading your ability to analyze and interpret information and so that to me has a lot of downstream value because once you have these heuristics and you can conserve energy on that specific area, that gives you either more energy to play longer sessions, or it gives you more energy to focus on the next piece of the puzzle that you're mm-hmm. looking to upgrade. And then guess what? You're still going to be tired at the end of your session because you're investing a lot of energy. But to me, that's sort of the process. And I don't, I don't think it's like, yeah, I don't think it's inefficient. I think it is just, that's the reality of it to me. Sure. And, uh, you know, again, I mean, this is this is one of those things that we're exploring, right? That's an excellent point. Uh, where I was going with this, uh, with all of this thing, is that eventually that's how I came about all of these things that we're talking about, like the poker trifecta, right? Mm-hmm. So what I discovered was it's, it's actually very similar to what you said earlier, some common spots, uh, the idea of the common spots. But instead of focusing the energy on making a decision on every single spot, my decision making started to happen. I was like, okay, how complicated is this hand? Is this hand at a level where, you know, I can think at the top of the iceberg? Is it a hand that I need to think a little bit deeper? Is it a hand where I need to think a little bit deeper? So basically the decision making started to shift a little bit from the exact hand in place. So like I'm I'm 100% focused on every hand that I play, I guess maybe you can also call that unconscious competence to, to some degree yes. when it comes to life, yeah. right? Yeah, which is would be a f- very fair point, right? I mean, it would be a very fair point. It's like a, a very complicated way to conquer simplicity. <laughs> but it was interesting that that happened. And and it was working, by the way, because if it didn't work, I wouldn't be talking about it. When you like have a typical, a prototypical player who are like so face up and they do the same mistakes over and over again, 
you approach that player completely different than somebody who comes sophisticated and you see them like trying different things when they play against you. And you, then you decide how deeper you're going to go into the iceberg is, is what yeah. I was about to say. So shifting of the energy, not necessarily to hand by hand, but like how much complexity we want to put into specific hands. Yeah. And so for my kind of final, final thoughts here on this topic, one thing that just sprang to mind as it related to the oversimplification problem of poker. In order to simplify, you need to understand the problem. And you need to understand the problem in a very intimate way. You need to understand it from head to toe, every single piece of the puzzle, how they all fit together. Only when you understand it, can you simplify. You cannot simplify if you don't understand. And so if you are simplifying in a situation that you do not understand, you're most likely oversimplifying. So that to me, yeah, that, that's how I would go about identifying um, whether or not you're oversimplifying a situation. And also it kind of ties into, you know, how do we make the game easier or simpler over time? Well, the only way that I'm going to make the game simpler coming from that paradigm is by understanding the entire game. That's it. That That's the only way for me to simplify it, right? And so that, that becomes the quest of if I were able to look at all the pieces of information and be able to like see the commonalities and see the threads and how does this tie into this, then I can make these heuristics and I can simplify in a way that isn't oversimplifying because it still holds true to the, the strategy of the situation. So yeah, those are kind of my, my final thoughts here uh, as we're winding down this, uh, this episode. And uh, they are so wise that I think we should leave it to that. I, I love that. So do not uh, oversimplify. Uh, do not just do not even simplify before you even understand like the the hardcore elements of the game. And be wary of people who do that for you. So right. it's okay for people to say that these are the simple things that you can do, but you need to understand why. And that sometimes may take like ten thousand hours or more. Right. And the the trust level that you have in this person. Can they explain this situation to you? Can they teach this at like just all the mechanisms of what's going on? Because like if they can't, then they don't understand the simplification. So trusting their simplification, it can be detrimental and, and oftentimes just folly. And with that, I think we had a, an excellent yeah. conversation, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Duncan. Always great talking to you. And uh, yeah, to hop in the discussion of these Philosophical Friday episodes, hit greatnessvillage.com. Check out Duncan's book. You can go ahead, give your book a plug here. Duncan, tell them where they can find it. I believe. Oh, sure. Yeah. I keep, I keep forgetting that, you know, yeah. my publisher is going to kill me. So the, the, the book is called why Alex uh, beats Bobby uh, at poker by the, uh, the great DNB publishing. And you can also find these conversations on YouTube. Why Alex Beats Bobby. Very, very simple. You can find it uh, on YouTube or you can join us on, on Twitter at uh, CPG uh, Podcast and the Ask the Math DR on, on Twitter. So I thought you were going to plug your book and say, by the great Duncan Palomortis. I appreciate the void of confidence, you know. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> the moment I will think uh, of myself as great is the moment I stop growing. So I, I will never say that or think that. But um, thank you for, for the opportunity. Yep. Um, thank you to listener and we'll catch you next week. Bye guys. So take care, man.